Hello there, girls, boys, and as always, others. Last time, uh, we did a few different bits and bobs, and what we're going to have to do is round up off that knowledge and learning and stuff uh, to make sure that we're all happy with it. So first job to do is we are going to check out uh, the worksheet that I gave you, C13.4. Uh, it was your emissions. <laughs> your emissions. Um, it was about your emissions and your carbon footprint. Okay, so this was the sheet that I was talking about. Um, loads and loads of different questions here. And at the very, very bottom uh, was the website that you had to go on to to calculate your carbon footprint. I did advise you to do that first of all, um, just because then that helps you figure out the rest, the answers to the rest of the questions anyway. So what we're going to do is have a look through the answers. OK, the version that you're seeing on the screen is on my Remarkable. Uh, therefore, I've trimmed down the formatting just so it fits a little bit better onto your screen. So don't be worried if it doesn't look exactly like your worksheet. OK, so number one, following uh, doing your carbon footprint calculator, list the activities in your own daily routine that contribute to your personal carbon footprint. What do people have for this? So there were quite a few different answers um, that people have given, but there was quite a few different answers on the mark scheme as well. Let's see if we've got the similar sort of things. So respiration, obviously breathing, um, that does give off carbon dioxide. Use of any transport, whether that be um, cars, buses, um, trains, or if you and your family go on holiday a fair bit, maybe it might involve boats, ferries, or even planes. Now, planes are massively, massively dangerous when it comes to emissions, and they give off so much carbon dioxide, it's absolutely crazy. Um, what else? Things around the house. So, using electricity, whether it be to charge your phone, uh, turn on the lights, cook food, uh, hair dryer, straighteners, PlayStation, Xbox, whatever, all those things use electricity. Therefore, they're going to be, they're going to contribute to carbon emissions. Whether or not you do recycling. Recycling is obviously a very good idea um, because that reduces the amount of stuff that we have to extract in the first place. They're the kind of four basics that will affect your carbon footprint. Three ways that you can reduce your own personal carbon footprint. Now, depending on what you do and who you are, there's quite a few different answers that we could go for here. Um, <laughs> breathing less, um, whilst yes, that would cut emissions, is not necessarily a good way to go um, because, you know, then you die. So don't stop breathing to save the planet. Try and cut down your carbon emissions in other ways. For example, turning the lights off. Turning the temperature down in your house, if you can. A lot of parents are quite funny about that. My stepdad, you are not allowed to touch anything to do with the heating. You've got in trouble if you touched anything to do with the heating. Um, good old Brian. Um, so let, let's write a few of these down. So turning off electrical equipment. So uh, the lights, um, your charger when you're not using it because even when it's plugged in it can still be drawing a charge turn it off at the wall it won't be drawing a charge anymore okay so there's massive way that you most of you will be able to cut your emissions there quite quickly um cycling walking rather than using uh cars or if that's not possible using public transport so i'm going to go for reduce high emission transport because that also includes, if possible, don't go on planes as much. Not that we are at the minute, anyway. Hey ho. Uh, what else have I got in the mark scheme here? Uh, use solar panels, if possible. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily within your power as 14, 15 year olds. Um, so that's one, two there that are quite realistic there. Um, any other ways? I think recycling's in your power, so let's go recycling. Uh, 
Okay, question three. Look at the table and identify any patterns that you can see about carbon footprints in different countries. This is interesting. So what did you lot think about this one? What patterns can you see from this table? I think one of the big things that stands out here is what we class as industrially developed nations they do have significantly higher emissions per person for example the united states united kingdom um qatar in particular australia they are very high in terms of their emissions so what we can actually see here in particular that's quite interesting is newly developed countries um those that are still having sort of really big industrial revolutions we're talking things like thailand for example here at the bottom in 1990 that was only 1.8 tons per person whether in 2006 um it's 4.3 so that's quite a sharp rise whereas even in um let's say Singapore, Singapore has got quite a bit of decent development there. They've got 15.6 tons in 1990 and actually they've cut their emissions down to 12.8. Uh, so there's some very interesting ideas there. Um, Qatar is frightening. They've already had the highest in uh, 1990 and then in 2006 that's nearly doubled, well no, over doubled uh, to 56.2 from 25.2. That's frightening. Um, Qatar, there's a heck of a lot of industry and a heck of a lot of money there. So uh, they've got to be a little bit careful with their emissions there. So quite a few different conclusions that we can make from that data. Um, it'd be interesting to see what their 2016 data would be like as well. Hmm. Anyway, question four. Explain why the trebling of the carbon footprint in 1990 uh, to 2006 in a country like Bangladesh is such a concern, even though the footprint is relatively low per person. OK, so let's have a look at Bangladesh. Yeah, so 0 0.1 up to 0 0.3. Now, that is, yeah. So that is the lowest emission on both counts there. So in theory, we can just go, yeah, that's fine. But the fact that it's trebled in, what is that, 16 years? That's quite frightening. Can you imagine if it was Qatar's that trebled? Frightening pattern there. Not only that, what this data doesn't account for is what the population of that country actually is. Now, in Bangladesh, there is a huge population. So... The fact that it's 0 0.1 might not seem that bad, but that's because there is a lot of people there. If they had a comparable um, population to the United Kingdom, for example, their emissions would be much higher compared to everybody else's. So as we've said before, climate data and emissions data is, is very tricky to get a sort of definite answer from. The data, how this presented here, if you looked at it on face value, you might say Bangladesh's emissions aren't quite not bad at all. But actually, there are other factors there that we do need to bear in mind. For example, population, population density, land spread, all sorts of things like that will have an effect on emissions. Question five. Explain why there must be worldwide agreement on people's carbon footprints. As we've discussed before, the emissions that we create here in the UK are not necessarily going to stay just above the UK. The emissions that are from different countries travel all the way around the world to different places, okay? Carbon dioxide, for example, doesn't sort of come up from England and go, ooh, the Scottish border, no, we shall not pass. It doesn't work like that. Air currents take them wherever they need to go. American air goes to Russian air. It's not a nuclear fallout because of that. It's just the climate. That's what happens. OK, so we do need to have a worldwide approach to dealing with carbon emissions and other emissions, too. Now, the next bit, um, the questions bit, we'd already done in lessons anyway. So it was the effects of global warming, for example, desertification uh, and damaging of crops uh, and people moving away from the seaside. We already discussed last lesson anyway, so we don't need to go over that. Skip. Next. Uh, student follow up. OK. A carbon tax, one or two of you suggested carbon taxes uh, in last lesson, so well done to you, heads up there. Um, 
Carbon tax has been introduced by some governments to encourage the use of low emission fuels. The amount of tax depends on how polluting the fuel is. In some countries, the amount of car tax depends on the size of a car's engine and the exhaust emissions it produces. This encourages use of biofuels, which are described as carbon neutral. OK, two new words there. And that's what the first two questions are actually about. They're asking, what is a biofuel? And what does carbon neutral mean? Now, a biofuel is, there are a few different variations of it. I'll be very interested to hear if you lot have actually heard of any biofuels. But what a biofuel basically is, it is a fuel made from plants. And the great thing about plants is obviously they do photosynthesis. So with a biofuel, the biological thing that you extract it from, again, usually plants, um, you have they have got to have absorbed carbon dioxide within the time that they are alive. And then when they're made into fuels, that carbon dioxide is released again. So um, let's just go here. Fuel made from plants, for example, uh, vegetable oil. Um, in Lincolnshire, where we are, you'll have seen a lot of the fields being bright yellow at certain times of year. Uh, and that plant is called the rape plant. A very unfortunate name. Um, but that produces something called rapeseed oil, which is highly energetic. So that is a great source of a biofuel. Carbon neutral, um, many biofuels are carbon neutral. And what that means is the carbon the carbon dioxide that they uh, absorb whilst still alive is kind of equal or equivalent or approximately equal to the emissions that are given off. So let's write this a little bit better. The carbon dioxide absorbed whilst the source, let's just go for, so wherever it may be for is alive is equivalent to the carbon dioxide emitted when used as a fuel and one bit of language that I saw uh, on the exams, I think it must have been last year, is the idea that there is no net change in carbon dioxide. So the stuff that's absorbed is also emitted at the same rate. So as it's being used up, it's being produced as well. So it, there's no overall change. So let's just put that no net or overall change in CO2 levels. Okay. Okay, question two. Congestion charges is kind of in certain bits of London, you're only, you get charged for using the roads. A bit like uh, if, you know, to go across the Humber Bridge, you've got to pay your £1.50 or whatever it is. The fee for the Humber Bridge is just to pay for the original cost of building the Humber Bridge. Whereas in London, they've put specific charges on specific sections of roads to reduce people using those roads and reduce the pollutions. This is exceptionally important in cities because in cities, they're so densely packed that it's hard for the pollutants to kind of escape off into the atmosphere. So they build up in particular areas and it's just very poor air quality there, which leads to illnesses. So each car is charged with a congestion charge. However, buses and trains aren't. So in that way, you might have to pay a ridiculous fee for driving through one particular part of London. Whereas if you just go on the bus, you don't. That sounds like a pretty good idea. And that's basically the idea of it, that it discourages people from using those roads. So. Let's have a look. So 
let's go now just say six at uh, five marks here i have no idea what the five marks are for and um, the mark scheme hasn't got five specific points to cover let's just kind of ignore the marks bit uh, but here we go so it discourages people from using cars so it cuts car based emissions now I don't know off the top of my head if motorbikes still have to pay and mopeds and things like that bikes certainly don't pedestrians certainly don't don't know about motorbikes feel free to do some research and check that out for me so close car emissions encourages use of public transport which again, they're more uh, like emission efficient, I suppose would be a way of putting it, than most cars are. In addition to that, let's say there's 20 people on a bus, there might be more, there might be less, but that's taking 20 cars off the road. That makes a massive difference there. So because there's less cars on the road, there's likely to be less accidents <laughs> relating to cars because there's less cars present less traffic so it's easier for people to get where they're going and linked to the idea that people are using more public transport that means more money goes to uh, the local council the bus companies whatever so that can be reinvested in improving the roads in the first place finding alternative energy that idea of reinvesting that money is a really good one. Okay, so the last question uh, isn't necessarily a question, despite the fact it said it's worth six marks. Again, goodness knows why they've chosen six marks. Looking at the mark scheme for it, there's nothing, there's no like, this is mark number one, two, three. It's just they've put a number there because let's just put a number there. Uh, anyway, so uh, pretty much all of you had a go at this um, and it was really interesting seeing the different scores that people got came in. Um, if you got like 100%, that's spot on the average of where everyone is in the United Kingdom anyway. Um, if you got more than that, then it's possibly not good. If you got less than that, then it's great. But the important thing is learning from it. OK, that you have a look where the emissions come from. Now, you lot as teenagers, you don't really have that much control over what your household does. It's probably mum, dad, whoever's at home making the decisions on whether you have solar panels, what temperature the house is set to, what lights are on, what lights are off and all that sort of stuff. If you go on planes, I'd like to think that's not your choice at your age. Don't think you can book uh, flights. God, I hope you can't book flights. Um, where was I going with this? Yeah, so you don't have a lot of control of your carbon emissions from your household. So having a look at a few of them, it might have said things like, yeah, cut flights, uh, only run one car instead of two, take buses and stuff like that. A lot of it is out of your control. Um, so having a look at the mark scheme for this one was quite interesting because it didn't necessarily state what you should and shouldn't say. What it did do instead is compared it to the UK's average here we go um so this worksheet was produced in 2017 so it is three years out of date uh so this might be slightly different but what this has done here is broken down uh the different factors that contribute to carbon emissions here and talked about in for a typical person how much of that makes up their their actual carbon footprint Uh, so as we can see here, heating the home is, is probably the most, uh, the biggest factor there, uh, closely followed by things that you do for fun. I wonder what those people are doing for fun that uses so much uh, carbon, probably travelling different places. Heating swimming pools, that can't be cheap in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, use of public slash financial services. I don't know what that means. Um, but there's quite a few different things there that build up each person's carbon footprint. So what were the key ideas that we needed to take away from this? Uh, the idea is that everything you do, everything you use has a carbon 
a mission associated with it and that therefore lots of people all around the world do need to be very careful about what we are doing and what we are using because that does affect our carbon footprints which doesn't affect just the people near us it affects the entire world key terms that we've covered today biofuels that's a very important bit of key language there so biofuel is a fuel typically produced from plants whether it be rapeseed oil whether it be sugarcane sugarcane is a way of producing ethanol which is a biofuel there um, or something like veg oil or stuff like that the great thing about biofuels are they are carbon neutral and what carbon neutral means is that there is no net gain or loss unfortunately of carbon dioxide these plants that are used to make the biofuel take in carbon dioxide when they're alive so when they are processed and made into a fuel the carbon dioxide that they release then is equal or equivalent to the carbon and carbon dioxide that they absorbed while they are alive so overall there is no increase in carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so that is the worksheet reviewed and a few of our key bits of language highlighted there. Next project that we're gonna be having a look at is the big five pollutants. There are five pollutants in particular that cause very specific problems. Uh, and for our course, you need to be aware of them, what issues they cause and how we can reduce the impact of those emissions. That's it for now. Goodbye, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others. Be gone, minions of science, be gone.